Okay, let me start by stating the obvious. Machines are not people. What's less obvious is there's simply no persuasive evidence that they're on the path to becoming generally intelligent, despite what you see in the movies. Artificial intelligence, ge artificial general intelligence, at least so far, is really little more than an aspiration or possibly a pipe dream. And frankly, I have not seen any perceptible progress toward it in my nearly 40 years in this field. Now, well, wait a minute, you might say. Doesn't the new wave of AI technology solve all sorts of complex reasoning and perception problems? Sure. They can perform tasks that humans solve using human intelligence. But that doesn't mean the machines are intelligent. It merely means that many tasks that, that uh, we thought pro, uh, required general intelligence are, in fact, subject to solution by much more narrow and mechanical means. Let me give you, there isn't much time, but I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Let's start with human versus electronic calculators. By the way, that's a picture of uh, Professor Bostrom from the back over there. I just want you to know. Okay. So, I have the answer. I'll tell you later. Okay. So let's take numerical calculations, for instance. As you may know, calculating used to be the province of highly trained specialists. They were known as calculators. Now, this profession required considerable intelligence, attention to detail, and skill. Indeed, solving arithmetic problems is still a common method of measuring so-called human IQ, which I won't have time to go into, but it's nonsense. Now all it takes is a 99-cent calculator. The calculator is infinitely faster and more accurate than humans are at this task. Now, does this mean that the calculator is super intelligent? Of course not. Let me take a more contemporary example, which is machine translation. Now, is... Uh, I had the incredible misfortune of picking an example that, um, uh, I'm sorry, Professor? Uh, Jeff Hinton? Yeah, yeah, Hinton, is he here? Uh, okay. uh, the Professor Hinton uh, undercut by saying there's a new generation of, of uh, technology to do this. So I'm going to give this, and then I'll talk a little bit about what he had to say. Um, until his talk, <laughs> tremendous strides have been made in the field in the past few years. <laughs> And, and machines now perform this task. They do perform this task nearly as well as human. But how do people perform this difficult task? They learn two or more languages along with their respective cultures and conventions. They read some text in one language. They understand what it says. And then they render it as closely, the meaning as closely as possible in the other language. Now, by contrast, up until a recurrent neural network approach, at least, um, computer translations programs work mainly by applying statistical and machine learning techniques to large bodies of concorded text. So machine translation, as successful as it has been, really bears no obvious relationship to the human translation progress process. And does that mean, uh, does that progress mean that machines are becoming more intelligent? Of course not. It, its success simply means that with access to enough examples, there's another way to approximate the same results. Are the robots taking over? Machines already perform all sorts of tasks, once believed to require uh, human attention from exploring the oceans to re reviewing surveillance video to administering anesthesia during surgery to discovering new drugs. Now, does this mean that the machines are getting smarter, much less taking over? Of course not. The plain truth is that AI isn't some sort of magical pixie dust that you sprinkle into programs that makes them smart. It's a collection of mostly software engineering techniques that can be applied to a broad variety of practical problems. So my point is simple. Lots of problems that we think require intelligence to be solved actually don't. There are other ways to solve them, and that's what we're using the machines to do. Now, come back to this anthropomorphism point. There's a long and undistinguished history of grandiose claims in the field, gratuitous anthropomorphism, and consequent disappointments in the field of AI. And I'm an old guy. I've lived through several such cycles. Does anybody here remember symbolic systems? Uh, general problem solvers? Frames versus scripts? The big debate about that? Connection machines? Expert systems? Uh, fifth generation computers? Remember that? The Japanese are coming? Uh, each was touted as a harbinger of the AI apocalypse in its own time. And I'm sorry to say, 
uh, I think we're well into a new bubble of hype, uh, and its inevitable deflation will, will follow. Now, this is entertaining, to be sure, but the problem is that it's sucking the oxygen out of the public discussion, and even out of a lot of the academic debates. It's distracting from the very real and somewhat opaque problems that uh, AI technology is creating, uh, despite the obvious and very real benefits of the technology. And that's what my book is all about, available in bookstores everywhere. <laughs> uh, so having wasted half my talk, uh, dispelling what I think of as myths, let me turn to the real dangers and what we need to do about them. Now, AI is fueling an expansion and acceleration of the continuing process of automation. And this means that it transforms labor markets and drives increasing wealth inequality. Those are the two big problems that I see are, going, are happening and are going to get a lot worse. And let me explore each of these in turn. The first thing to recognize is the robots aren't coming to take our jobs. Uh, they're coming, but not exactly for our jobs. Uh, machines and computers don't perform jobs. What they do is they automate tasks. And except in extreme cases, you don't roll in a robot and show an employee to the door. Instead, what the new technology does is it hollows out and changes the jobs that people perform. Even experts spend most of their time doing mundane, repetitive tasks like reviewing lab test results, drafting simple contracts, filling out paperwork and forms. You know, on the blue-collar side, lots of workers uh, lay bricks, paint houses, mow lawns, drive cars, load trucks, pack boxes, take blood samples, fight fires, deliver mail, and direct traffic. And many of these intellectual and physical tasks require straightforward logic or simple hand-eye coordination. And new technologies, a lot of the stuff you've seen today, mainly driven by artificial intelligence, are poised to automate a lot of these tasks. So the problem is if your job involves a narrow, well-defined set of duties, and many do, then indeed your employment is at risk. If you have a broader set of responsibilities or Importantly, if your job requires a human touch, such as expressing sympathy or providing companionship, uh, I don't think you have much to worry about. Uh, but even when machines make people more productive rather than replacing them, they change the skill sets that get them done. Accountants who used to spend their time filling in forms now advise on tax strategy. Bank tellers... Uh, who used to dole out cash and things like that at the bank, now what they, they're trained to do is to sell banking services. Lawyers that used to research precedents and go through discovery documents, now they spend their time crafting arguments. So this creates what the economists call structural or sometimes it's called technical unemployment, the mismatch of the skills that people have to the needs of the employers. So the more pressing problem posed near term by AI for workers is not so much the lack of jobs, but the way new technology transforms the nature of work and therefore the training that's required to perform these jobs. And AI technology is going to accelerate this process. It's what this conference is about. There are three million professional drivers in the U.S. whose jobs are threatened by autonomous driving. Now, how many of them are going to be well-suited for the jobs of the future, like doing social media promotion? It's a problem. All this automation doesn't mean the end of work. That's another myth. Jobs aren't going away. It never has. We create more jobs than we destroy in the end. The new wealth that's created by these new technologies creates demand for all kinds of new products and services. So the thing you have to think dynamically, what are the jobs of tomorrow? And the future jobs, the things that are left after we automate these boring, repetitive, automated, automatable tasks, um, are likely to be those that require a human touch or some kind of demonstration of skill. So we're likely to become a society of competitive gamers, of artisans, of personal shoppers, of flower arrangers, of tennis pros, of party planners, and no doubt a lot of other things that don't exist yet. Look. Folks, nobody wants to go to a robotic undertaker that says, I am so sorry for your loss. That's not the future. So when we talk about automating all the jobs, that's not what's going to happen. Now, in my book, available in bookstores everywhere, 
I discuss ways to address this problem. We need a new approach to vocational training, so it becomes a lifelong activity. And we need to create new financial vehicles, this is a policy issue, to underwrite this new training uh, that are secured by your future earnings capacity. And in my book, I talk about this. I call them job mortgages. It's not an entirely new idea with me. It's a lot of economists have talked about this. But the point is, tie the, uh, tie the training to the economic value that it, that it creates. You need, we, need, we don't have that feedback loop, and we need it. Uh, as economists understand, automation is the substitution of capital for labor. And I'm here to tell you that Karl Marx was right. <laughs> this, the struggle between capital and labor is a losing proposition for the workers. What that means is that the, the benefits of automation naturally accrue to those who can invest in the new systems, and many of you are in the room. Put plainly, that means that the rich get richer and everyone else is left behind. And this is exactly what we're seeing today. Uh, financiers are building ever larger mansions in Silicon Valley, while on Main Street, workers in towns and cities across the country are losing their houses. The executives at Uber are throwing lavish parties in San Francisco, and you've got bread lines forming in places like Detroit. So what has all this got to do with AI? The technologies that are on the drawing boards in our labs are going to accelerate this process. Now, some people have the mistaken impression that the free market will address these problems if only we get the government out of the way. Well, I'm here to tell you that our economy is hardly an example of unfettered capitalism. The fact is there are all sorts of rules and policies that drive where the capital goes, how it's deployed, and who gets the returns. The problem is that our economic and regulatory policies are ill-suited to address the challenges that are posed by accelerating automation. They become decoupled from our social goals. And we have to fix that. But how? Very briefly, I've got good news on this. We tend to think of these things statically, but the economy is not static. In the U.S., I'm using U.S. figures here, I apologize, um, the, the amount of wealth in the country doubles every 40 years, and it has done this reliably since the start of the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. And what does that mean? It means that in 40 years from now, most likely there will be literally twice as much wealth to go around. So the challenge for us is to implement policies that will encourage that wealth to be more broadly distributed. We don't have to steal from the rich and give to the poor. We need to provide ways to ensure that the newly created wealth is more broadly distributed. So in my book, available in bookstores everywhere, I give an example of the sort of free market policies that can support these, uh, this goal. For example, I propose that we make corporate taxes progressive based on how broadly distributed a company's equity is. So the more stockholders in a company uh, suitably defined, the lower their tax rate. And this provides an competitive advantages to corporations that benefit larger swaths of society. Now, it's just one idea. It's just the kind of thinking we need to do. And progressive policies like this can promote our social goals without stifling economic growth. We just have to get on with it and stop believing the myth that unfettered capitalism is the answer to our world's problems. That's the look of shut up and get off. So I'm going to wrap up and say I want you to understand that I am not AI. I think the potential impact on the world is similar, and I am not exaggerating, to the invention of the wheel. But we need to think of it not as some kind of magical discontinuity in the development of intelligent life on Earth, but as a powerful collection of automation tools with the potential to transform our livelihoods and vastly increase our wealth. The challenge that we face is that our existing institutions, without some enlightened rethinking, run a serious risk of making a mess of the opportunity. I am supremely confident that the future is more Star Trek than Terminator, but that transition may be protracted and brutal unless we pay attention to the issues that I've raised here today. Our technology and our economy should serve us, not the other way around. Thank you very much.